Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are here in State of Florida versus Curtis Reeves, case number 142106 CFAES. I'm sorry, 216 CFAES. Here in Division I Crime, 6th Judicial Circuit, Pasco County, Florida. Present for the state is Mr. Garcia, Ms. Sumner, Mr. Lowry there in the back, spotted you this time, as well as Mr. Crable. Uh, present for the defense is Mr. Escobar and Mr. Michaels. The defendant is present in the courtroom and dressed out uh, in civilian clothing. Uh, the defendant is in the least restrictive restraint that meets the sheriff's ability to maintain security in the courtroom. Captain Ferrantelli uh, is present for... Uh, Sir. There he is. There's Captain Ferrantelli. Uh, Captain Ferrantelli, this is against the policy and procedure of the sheriff's office, but you're doing this at the direction of the court. Is that correct? May I approach the bench? You may. For the record, my name is Mike Ferrantelli. I'm a Pasco County captain. Yes, it, this uh, practice of him not being in hand restraints and black box is against our general orders. Statutorily, the sheriff is charged with the safety and security of the court, the members thereof. And this is something that we would normally do for any person charged with that level of crime. Therefore, we object to him not being in handcuffs and shackles. Yeah. I mean, handcuffs and black box. Right. Thank you, Captain Ferrantelli. Thank you. Okay, we've got a long morning ahead of us and perhaps a long afternoon, so I'd now ask that everybody check their cell phones to make sure they're turned off. Not set to vibrate, but in fact turned off unless you're a credentialed <laughs> member of the media that's in advance had this approved by uh, our public information officer, Ron Stewart. Uh, the reason that I'm asking you to turn your cell phone off rather than just set it to silent is that uh, on top of we don't allow texting or, or uh, internet surfing in court, we also have a policy uh, because it creates uh, feedback. So especially if you're going to be a witness at some point, you're going to be uh, brought up anywhere near our sound system. It interferes with all aspects of our sound system and creates very unpleasant feedback. Um, we are going to be conducting court business until 11.10 a.m. or as close as possible as we can get to 11.10 a.m. Uh, we'll then take a 10-minute comfort break. We're going to keep it 10 minutes, so if, uh, if we say 10 minutes, my expectation is we will, be, we will be back truly in 10 minutes. It's the court's intention at that point to then proceed for another hour and 10 minutes before a break. We're gonna see where we are at that point. If it looks like we can, we're close to getting completed, then we'll keep going through lunch. If it looks like there's no chance we're gonna get completed, we'll take an appropriate hour lunch break and we'll come back directly on time and proceed from there until we've exhausted all the witnesses and all the argument that we need to hear today. With these scheduled 
breaks in mind, please be considered on coming and going from the court. Uh, I understand sometimes you have to get up and leave, but please try to be as little of a distraction as possible. Additionally, and it almost seems strange saying this because you've been so eerily quiet this morning, uh, please limit your conversations given that the more conversations we have and how bad we generally are at whispering, um, the more people that are talking in the audience, the more the, the sound grows and it becomes difficult for me to communicate with the litigants up here. And I know everybody wants to hear what's going on and that only happens if we, if we stay quiet in the audience. Uh, if one of the bailiffs asks you to step outside, it's not optional. I expect you to comply on the first time and without discussion with the bailiffs. Once you're outside the room, feel free to discuss with them whatever the issue is, but please, if they ask you to step outside, don't give them any grief or aggravation. Just step outside. They'll talk to you about whatever it is they're concerned about, uh, but it's, it's not a request that can be politely declined. You have to go. Um, Mr. Garcia, is the state ready to proceed this morning? Yes, sir. Your Honor. Are you going to ask that the rule be invoked during this bond proceeding, or can we dispense with that? Um, Judge, I would ask that the rule be invoked. Okay. Um, and Mr. Escobar, is the defense ready to proceed? The defense is ready to proceed, Your Honor. Uh, when the rule is invoked, the rule basically means the witnesses are not to discuss the questions asked during the proceedings, the content of their testimony, or what any other witness testified. The witness may only discuss their testimony uh, with the attorneys outside of court during the proceeding, and that includes during any recesses. Do we have any witnesses that are present in the courtroom that we need to ask to step outside at this point? I believe for the defense there are, yeah. Okay. Um, can uh, one of your colleagues uh, have your witnesses step outside? I'll have my investigator. Okay. To the many people that have come to observe the proceedings in this court of law, please remember that uh, this is not a crowd participation event. Everyone's always welcome to observe, but unless you are called as a witness or one of the attorneys recognized by the court, you're not allowed to offer your input. During the proceedings, you're absolutely not allowed to yell out, sigh heavily, or do anything else that's going to draw attention to yourself during the testimony of the witnesses or the arguments of attorneys. Please excuse, your, excuse yourself from the room quietly if uh, you don't feel that you can comply with these instructions. Um, let's see, what else do we have to do before we get started? Um, let me wait until you've had a chance to get all your witnesses to step outside. Mr. Reeves, good morning, sir. This is the first time you and I are meeting, uh, either in person or seeing you over the video screen. Um, I'm the judge that's been assigned to your case. As per the law, as instructed by the law, as a condition of the oath that I took, I presume you to be innocent in this case. You're going to hear a lot of things during the course of this proceeding. Nothing affects the fact that the Constitution and the law instruct me to presume you innocent, and I hold my oath to be a very important matter, which I take very seriously, so I'm going to continue to do that. During the course of the proceeding, um, you're represented by counsel, you're represented by one attorney who I've known for many years and one attorney who I know by reputation. I am confident that they're going to give you effective legal guidance. I want to make sure during the course of the proceeding you have the opportunity to communicate with them if you need to. You've probably been given a flex pen already. Did it get a flex pen? All right. You've been given a flex pen already, so you can make notes. If at some point, though, and I realize there's a lot of cameras and a lot of people here, if at some point you need to communicate with your attorneys in private, you let me know or they'll let me know, and I'll give you a chance to talk with them in the back if that's what you, in fact, need to do. All right. During the course of the proceedings, at any point, if you feel that you have a concern that your attorneys have not been able to address with you or not been able to answer adequately, and I don't expect this to happen, but it's always possible, I want you to feel free to speak with me directly. This, of course, has to be on the record, but if at any point there's any issue that you have that you just don't think is being addressed adequately, you always have the right, as does any defendant in any criminal proceeding, to communicate with me directly on the record. Okay? All right. During the course of today's proceeding, I may ask questions of the participants, those of you that have appeared in front of me in the past. 
know my habit of asking some specific and pointed questions at times. I want to make sure that everybody understands I'm not asking these questions to make a point, to prove a point, or to suggest a point. I'm asking these questions because, quite honestly, I want the answer, and I want to hear a spirited defense of whatever position it may seem like I'm challenging, because that's the only way that I get a pointed and direct answer if I ask very pointed, sometimes unpleasant, and sometimes un uh, uncomfortable direct questions. So please, to all those that have a side in this case, don't think because I'm asking these direct questions that I've made my mind up in any way. It's more, I just need the answer, and I need you to answer me in such a specific way that the only way I'll get that answer is if I ask a very specific and sometimes uncomfortable question. Before we begin the bond proceeding, it's my intention to address the temporary stay on discovery and the video. Uh, I was given a copy of the video after court by the state and defense with a request that I review it prior to the hearing. Um, the copy that I have is two views from inside the theater and two views of the lobby common area of the theater. Um, and I addressed with the state and defense this morning whether I had a bad copy or it's just the way the video looks. And it sounds like that's just the way the video looks. So let's talk about discovery and the discover, discovery material uh, as it is subject to public requests now that a charge has been filed and the defense has indicated that are, they are participating in discovery. Defense, now that you've had a time to review a portion of the discovery that you've been provided, do you still request that the court restrict public and media access to this discovery available in the case? And do you have a proposed written order restricting that discovery? Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court, Richard Escobar, for purpose of the record. Your Honor, we uh, had an opportunity uh, yesterday uh, afternoon, late afternoon, uh, to review this video. I, I think it's important, and I, I know the court is familiar with some of the facts surrounding this video, but I think it's important first to understand that this video uh, comes from uh, what appears to be two infrared uh, cameras that uh, were located within Theater 10, and they were located in the bistro section. Uh, which is the very top section of that particular theater. Uh, in picturing the theater, you have a bistro section that sits about six feet up. Then you have a center section, which is for the general population. Then you have even a lower section. Uh, these two particular uh, cameras appear to be in that, uh, in that uh, bistro area and only capture a small uh, area of the theater. And when I'm saying small, very small area, of just a few rows of that particular theater. That camera, uh, in speaking to members of the Sheriff's Office and uh, members of, of Mr. Garcia's uh, uh, prosecution team, we were told that that uh, camera only captures video upon movement. Uh, at this point in time, none of us know whether that infrared is an accurate infrared uh, that is capturing all movement or whether that particular infrared is, uh, needs a certain amount of movement before it activates and starts uh, playing or recording uh, a video. What you see in this video is exactly that. You don't see a continuous run of video from the very beginning of when Mr. Reeves comes into the theater, continuous all the way until uh, Mr. Olson is, is finally uh, uh, fallen to the ground. What you see is little snippets that one would have to assume uh, occurred as a result of some movement, but there's going to be no expert today that I'm aware of that's going to be able to come in here and tell the court that number one, that video as it's portrayed is accurate, fair and accurate depiction of everything that occurred at that point in time. Certainly, in looking at the video, you can't see any facial expressions, you can't see any real detail that is so critical uh, for the evaluation of what took place uh, in that theater. And so what I am proposing to the court, listen, at some point in time, we all believe that that video is going to be uh, shown in court uh, and used as a piece of evidence. But we need to be very careful as to when that video should be publicized uh, to the general media. That video should be publicized to the general media only when we have an expert that can examine those cameras, can testify to the accuracy of what it's collecting and can testify to the accuracy of what the video itself has captured so that anyone viewing that video can actually see what actually may have happened that day. 
The video's blurry, whether it can be enhanced, we have no idea yet. Certainly we're gonna have our experts take a look uh, at that video and see if it, if it can be enhanced. If it's enhanced, it's to our favor. We want that video to be enhanced. But we're not at that point at this point in time. And so when you're disseminating a video that only has bits and pieces of what is alleged to have happened in that theater, it is extremely prejudicial because you're going to get the general public speculating about, well, what happened between here? Well, I know what happened between here. But what happened between here? Oh, and, and I think I can see a facial expression here, and I think I, oh, I think I can see this here, when in reality it's not there. And you have no expertise, nobody testifying before this court, giving any solid basis for reliability. And that's what we've got to be careful with here. You know, Your Honor, I think the court well knows that under the rules of evidence there is a uh, there's a particular section, uh, it's 403, that we use quite often. Uh, and that 403 uh, issue uh, comes, I think, right into play in a situation like this. Uh, apart from the fact that there's no constitutional right, no First Amendment right to pretrial discovery, apart from the fact that 406 gives this court the authority to, fa to, uh, to fashion certain orders protecting the fundamental, fundamental fairness for Mr. Reeves, you have a 403 issue that we've got to overcome. And is it more probative than prejudicial? At this point, I think not. There's nothing more that the defense would like at some point in time than to introduce that video ourselves. But the reality of it is, in the law, it is way too dangerous today. When you look at, uh, at the law in this case, Your Honor. Before you get into that, you're focused like a laser on the video right now. I am. I want to, I, and I consider the video to be part of discovery, a very important part of discovery, but I'm not there yet. I'm more concerned with the police reports, the witness statements, and every other aspect of what they're going to be requesting in discovery. The video I consider to be a subject in and of itself, separate from the others, above the others. Uh, what about the police reports? What about the witness statements? What about incident reports, evidence collection sheets? Um, photos of the crime scene, things like that. Where, what's, what's the defense's position on that? Because we're going to spend more time after this talking about the video. I'm, I'm talking discovery in general right now. Your Honor, uh, our position is going to be the same with reference to uh, the police reports and the general discovery that we've been given. And let me tell you why. For example, let's take uh, an example of some of the written statements of some of the witnesses. It doesn't appear that any of those witnesses on those written statements appear to be placed under oath. And so, uh, they're just writing down uh, recollections uh, of what they believe occurred during that period in time. We haven't had an opportunity yet to question those witnesses, to even confront those witnesses as to the accuracy of those recollections. Same issue. If we have not had an opportunity to engage in any pretrial discovery in order to confront those issues, then are we really disseminating information at this point in time that we really have no confidence in just yet? Because our system of justice, when we gain confidence of statements, it's when the defense has the right to confront those statements and explore those, those statements for their truth. What I'm saying is that those statements are going to be coming in at some point in time. We may have witnesses that come in today and make statements. But I'm going to have an opportunity to certainly confront those witnesses and examine those witnesses concerning those issues. It's premature. We are at a bond stage. We are not uh, anywhere near... Uh, in a position to be able to give the public, the court, uh, anyone, uh, some solid foundation as to what is truth and what is fantasy at this point in time. Well, then and let so, me ask you another question. Sorry I do this, but... It's okay. Uh, <laughs> I welcome How How is this going to be any better than what's going on right now? Because generally, <laughs> I, mean, I, I get my information on what's going on locally from Jack, Ted, and Corey on my way into work. I mean... But I poked my head out of the uh, rabbit hole last night and started looking around to see what I could find in the way of pretrial publicity. And there's a lot out there. And I saw things like uh, an allegation that he was wearing a bulletproof vest at advisories in a jail where nobody has any guns. I saw an allegation that he went out to his car and got his gun and came back in. I saw, I mean, I saw a lot of things that were wild speculation already. How is releasing the actual police reports and the actual witness statements going to make your client's situation any worse than that? Well, let me answer it this way. I, I think we've all experienced the wild speculation that is taking place out there even before these reports are given to anyone. These reports at this point in time, 
have not been confronted, they have, they have not been tested. Uh, we have really no sense of reliability yet for these particular reports. Just imagine giving the media access to all of these reports and the amount of speculation that we've had is going to increase 100 fold. There is no reason at this point in time, Your Honor, for us to feed that frenzy. That's not a reliable frenzy. Uh, we have to be able to try this case in this courtroom, not in the media. At some point in time, we've opened this courtroom to the media. At some point in time, they're going to be able to examine for themselves in their own minds whether a witness is going to be telling the truth or not. But we're not there yet. And one of the most important parts of, of this court's uh, function is the separation of powers. And this court has the power, through the separation of powers, to make sure that the most fundamental right that Mr. Reeves has, and that is fundamental fairness to be able to pick a jury of his peers from this county. We can't make a mistake that affects that most fundamental right that Mr. Reeves has. And the reason that the defense is being so cautioned is because that is the most important right that we can preserve here. There is absolutely no reason at this point in time for us to be disseminating to the public information that we have not had an opportunity to confront. And all I'm asking the court is give the defense some time to confront that information. And then we can release it. And we can release it in a responsible manner. Not just because the media wants to get a snippet exaggerated or make it something that is clearly just fantasy. And we've seen that with reference to uh, the media went out and said it was a bulletproof vest. It's prejudicial. We don't need it. We've got to control the evidence that's being disseminated in this case because publicity in this case is all the way from Dade City to Britain. I had me to New York, Nancy Grace, the Good Morning America. We turned them all down. It is such a high public case that we have to take special precautions to preserve his fundamental rights. Okay. Um, State, what's your position on the release of discovery? Judge, all we would say is, uh, first I'll address that. I think that the exemption at issue is uh, the criminal investigative intelligence exemption 119. And what that says is that um, investigative and, and other criminal intelligence information is, is exempt from public disclosure. However, upon release of the defendant, those things as to that exemption are now subject to public disclosure. So I think that's kind of the narrow issue that, that we're addressing here. Um, the typical, that's the typical process. Um, we think that uh, jury selection is intended to consider a lot of the matters that the defense has highlighted. And uh, given that, Judge, we leave it in your discretion. All right, balls in my court, in other words. Well, then a couple more questions to the defense. Obviously, we're not going to have anybody on a potential future jury. We're not going to allow anybody to be impaneled. They've got their information on the case from the media. We're going to only select jurors that have not formed an opinion yet and that have not seen the extensive pretrial coverage. How is it hurtful or how is it a problem for the rest of the community to be able to see and know what's going on in the court system? and get a more accurate picture of it based on the actual reports versus speculation as to what's in the reports. Your Honor, I, I think that there are, there are many members of the public at this point in time that probably have not uh, been prejudiced by some of the statements uh, that we find in the media. Uh, what I'm telling this court that there's no need to now uh, uh, taint that remaining group with any of this speculation. Um, clearly, uh, our goal is to be able to to have a trial in this county with a, a panel that represents Mr. Reeves' peers in this community. That is of utmost importance. I'd like to read to the court an excerpt from Estes versus uh, Texas, which is a, uh, a 1965 United States Supreme Court case. And it says, to safeguard the due process rights of the accused, the trial judge has an affirmative duty to minimize the effects of prejudicial pretrial publicity. Because of this constitutional duty, a trial judge surely should take the protective measures even when they are not strictly and inescapably necessary. The, the balancing test always favors the protection of the accused. Even when 
someone believes that it is not absolutely necessary. Because once the damage is done, Your Honor, we can't undo it. I think that the media is going to be able to have a lot of information from hearings like this where witnesses are being presented, when witnesses are being cross-examined. And isn't that the responsible way to get information out to the public? Isn't that the responsible way to assure that what the public is getting at least is being tested by the defense? That's my request, Your Honor. I think we've given uh, you know, the case, the court, some good case law. We cited the McCreary case, which again is pretty solid uh, with reference to the court's power in protecting this, this pretrial publicity. We've cited the U.S. Supreme Court case, which has wonderful language back from 1969 concerning this fundamental right. Uh, and I'm going to be asking the court today at least for a reasonable period of time uh, to give us an opportunity to go out and investigate and present information that's going to tell the media the truth. Give us that time to be able to confront those witnesses. Reasonable is a wonderful word because uh, it can mean lots of different things to lots of different people. Tell me, what does reasonable period of time mean to you today? Your Honor, I think a 